Hey, how are you guys doing? My name is Kevin Davani, Total Connector, host of the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. I'm so excited to have Hodlin out for the first time on my show and Knut Svanholm back again with his new book, Bitcoin Independence Reimagined after, you know, his, his amazing first book, uh, Sovereignty Through Mathematics. So, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about a bunch of topics. Um, Amongst others, um, written, I don't know, I have a list of questions about, you know, uh, technological innovation, exponentiality by word of magnitude, um, central banks, uh, cashless society, KYC, AML surveillance, you know, all this Aurelian shit is going on, negative interest rates, store of value, purchasing power, you know, the absolute scarcity, the sacrosanct essence of, of Bitcoin, uh, dependency, interdependency. Uh, so yeah, and the one shot principle. So yeah, make sure you follow uh, Hodlanat and Knut Svalma on Twitter. And um, Hodlanat, by the way, amongst others, you know, he's behind uh, Citadel Twenty One, where they bring you know publishing you know fantastic content. And uh, you can find uh, Knut Svalma's book on Amazon. So make sure you follow me, give it a like, retweet, share, whatever you do. You're, you're gonna help me and. Uh, Subscribe to my YouTube channel podcast platform. Thanks so much and looking forward to this talk. Fun. All right. Welcome to my show, to the Total Bitcoin Podcast show. Um, I have the real honor and pleasure to welcome uh, Knut Svanholm again and Holland out for the first time. Uh, welcome, guys. How are you guys doing? Thanks so much for your time. Doing great. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. I'm doing good. Thanks. Yeah, for my pleasure. Listen, I mean, uh, before I forget, <laughs> it's a strange room. Maybe, uh, maybe I need to take a break sometimes from Bitcoin, but uh, I had a, this strange dream last night and please uh, try not to laugh. So um, maybe it's because I went too much, too much, you know, too deep into the rabbit hole the last years, whatever science, technology, you know, uh, the woo woo stuff. So um, it was you. Uh, and, you know, because I was reading, you know, this few days for the third time, your book, um, uh, Knut, uh, Bitcoin uh, Independence Reimagined, and I got mixed up with the title. Now, let me tell you why, because I posted it, I tweeted it on, on Twitter, and and I had this dream where <laughs> you and Hodlnout came down with a spaceship. And then all of a sudden, I was in a dungeon in a prison, you know, like the Count of Monte Cristo, those dungeons, and I was reading... I was reading out of your book to Craig Wright and Craig Wright was like, you know, like a little child. I felt sorry for him. He was like, you know, this little stubborn child was like, I don't want to hear this. And it was like shouting like, huddle out, huddle out, help me. It was like, huddle out would, would be like the last, the last bastion, the last, you know, the last refuge of help. And I was like, no, you gotta imagine Bitcoin, imagine Bitcoin, you know? And then all of a sudden I woke up and I'm like, oh my God, you know, there's so many different angles, perspectives. I'm, you know, I'm trying to think of how to start this discussion today, you know? So anyway, so that's the story of today. So, <laughs> but, but, but it's this nightmare or, or dream or whatever you want to call it, you know, I had to tell me something and it was, it was hilarious. It was real hilarious. And, and I thought, uh, you know, I mean, I really feel sorry for Craig, right? He's just a delusional, whatever. I mean, can I can I even say that that he's uh, or I'm going to be sued for that anyway? It doesn't matter, you know the f word. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, he, I just feel sorry for him, and and I think uh, he will find redemption, and he will find you know he, he will eventually come to his reasons um, and senses. But he won't find Mr. Cat, and he won't find his spaceship. <laughs> yeah, and I was going to say the space cat is out of the bag. Because usually I say the cat is out of the bag, but now <laughs> out of love for Hollandot, I'm going to say the space cat is out of the bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Hollandot, um, you know, Knut, I, I, I got to know you for the first time uh, personally. Uh, that was the first and last time we saw each other uh, in Riga, right? So I got to know you a little bit. We, we, we already talked, you know, on our show. But Hollandot, I never, you know, interacted with you. I mean, I, you know, I read all kinds of stuff about you, and and it's really uh, f fascinating and thrilling. But could you, could you tell me a little bit who you are, where you come from, you know, what's your path to Bitcoin? Who are you? <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh... That's a good question. Um, I'm. Uh, I don't know if you read Knut's latest article in Citadel Twenty One, where he wrote about uh, his uh, his 
childhood stories with the Commodore 64. The, oh, was it on Citadel? Uh, was it called uh, Citadel 21 or something? Was it? Yes, on the... Citadel yeah. 21. Uh, it's uh, it's this uh, Bitcoin cultural scene I'm uh, making uh, with Bitcoin Katya. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think that's a good way to start to like maybe understand who I am. I, I was uh, very early into computers, 8-bit computing through the Commodore 64, just like Knut. And I just got uh, really fascinated with uh, this new world that computers opened up for me. And uh, I was early into this, this things called the bulletin board systems, like the precursor to, to the internet. And uh, starting off with like, I have had this very early interest in computers, starting with these old 8-bit computers uh, from Commodore. The Commodore 64, but um, yeah, so I was uh, my I had took an education in computers and basically started working as a system developer as a as a developer and um, did that for uh, some years. But I I kind of didn't. It was sometimes I think if you have a hobby and a love for something, it can destroy it a little bit if it becomes your profession. And that kind of happened for me because I had to work on coding very boring stuff or stuff I thought was boring. So, so I ended up changing paths and, uh, and uh, took a new education and became basically a, a teacher. So I worked for many years as a primary school teacher uh, here in Norway. And uh, yeah, I don't know, I was always, uh, I kind of saw the insanity of, uh, of central banking pretty early I'd say and I was always frustrated about inflation and like how it was difficult to to kind of store your work in a reliable manner so when I saw this reference to, to Bitcoin one random evening I was I was just reading a tech magazine I don't remember which and I saw a reference to Bitcoin and uh, that same evening I had uh, read the white paper and I I was absolutely hooked from that first uh, from that first evening and uh, I've never ever doubted uh, like Bitcoin's potential to to change the world and change lives and change the way we we do things uh, so yeah fell down the rabbit hole very hard very early and I've been there since fascinating you, you said you were once a, a primary school teacher now uh, that was a, like a long time ago when was that like uh couple of decades ago or, or? No, that was not a long time ago. I worked full time as a primary school teacher two years ago. Mm -hmm. And you had already like a, at least a basic understanding fundamentals of, of uh, I mean, oh, uh, you know, about Bitcoin, right? Um, yeah. My question, you, you know, because I, because Knut you know, talks about education and children brainwashing condition. Yeah. I'm like, what's what's your approach, you know, to You know what? Teaching? That's that, that's interesting because uh, I see uh, a lot of, I mean, obviously there are, there are a lot of binary binary opinions out there. And one of the binary opinions I see is public schooling bad, homeschooling good. <laughs> and uh, I can totally relate to that uh, opinion. And I think it's like on a macro level, it's probably pretty spot on. Uh, because there is indoctrination and there are political agendas going on in the school system, obviously. But yeah. uh, it all boils down, like I know this from being on the inside, it all boils down to the teacher you have. Yeah. And it, if you have a teacher that wants to create pupils that think for themselves and that just don't reproduce uh, information, but actually critically think on information, then you, you suddenly as a teacher, you have this amazing opportunity to red pill huge groups of people at a very early age. Uh, and when I say red pill, maybe I mean red pill them on the fact that not everything they read in the media is uh, are facts and that uh, there exists different uh, versions of truth and different versions of history. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, being able to like uh, put some uh, seeds in the minds of, uh, of kids. And uh, I basically think kids are amazing amazing versions of humans they are just so open and uh, i think we can learn a lot 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 from kids actually they they they're basically in this state before they are programmed yeah, yeah. 
And let me let me just say something because um, you know Knut, I mean you you break some taboos in your book because it's about you know usually one is told do not talk about religion and stuff, but you know and 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 probably I'm gonna just talk. I mean you and me, Knut, I mean with definitely uh, uh, you probably we all agree that it's um, this this whole indoctrination. Uh, it takes a form that um, you. You, you understand the consequences and the effects of it, you know, many decades later, later, because when I was like a kid, like seven years old, I came with my father from Iran to Austria, and then I was put into a Catholic, uh, purely like boy school, Catholic, uh, totally conservative school. Uh, where I had to sit, you know, in in the church, and you know, you didn't get the body of Christ, you know, the wafers they give you. So, um, and you know, there's this saying that give me give me the child, especially the the religious institute, give me the child before the age of seven, and I, something like that, and I will give you back something the adult. So it depends, like how do you, what kind of environmental conditions. Uh, does a child grow up in? You know, what's what's the potential you give that child? You know, in in, in terms of uh, you know unleashing the power of of intelligence, creativity, comprehension. Yeah, I think as 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 much as you can, uh, like if you manage to to erode some of the barriers early, or like open up some pathways, uh, making it natural for a child to explore them. At, at an early age, I think, I think you you give that child pretty much a big head start if the goal in life is to become uh, independent, basically. Totally agree. And the th the thing the schools do is that the, the, this curiosity is already in the child from yeah. birth. Yeah. And the which should, the the thing the institutions do does is it queefs the. Uh, the curiosity and takes it away from the kid and tells the kid not to be curious but this is how it is and yeah. they tell you how what to think instead of how to think mm -hmm. and uh, and that's that's the main problem whether it's religious institutions or state funded schools or whatever and like homeschooling can be just as bad it all depends on what parent the kid has absolutely and a lot of homeschoolers are uh, devout religious people that want to that, that's why they homeschool their kids and that's just as bad i mean um, uh, uh, it depends it depends because i got to know like parents from germany because there is the really strict enforcement of you you need to send your your school and i understood you know one day why so many people from germany uh, uh, emigrated to paraguay or other countries where you know there is no obligatory you know schooling but uh you know and and before I, you know, we go on, I just wanted to clarify, it applies to every, you know, religious dogma indoctrination, because I don't even know why, for example, Iran is theocratic or Islamic at all, because it actually goes back to Zoroasterism and Mithraism, which is more like, for me, like a more ethical, philosophical, you know, like open up your mind, you know, uh, and, and, and be good, you know, it's like it's really simple principles, yeah. like, like Bitcoin, you know, like, yeah, it's, yeah, but mm. it's a, those things always get hijacked by, by, uh, by dogmatic, like, like you bigger uh, entities. I mean, I have nothing against faith. Uh, I'm, I'm not, in, not religious at all myself, and I don't believe there is a creator or whatever. Uh, but I have nothing against personal beliefs in in this or that. I'm I'm a, but I do think that uh, organized religions are really, yeah. really dangerous things, yeah. and they can they can lead to really bad things. And I view the state mm. uh, as a religion in most cases, at yeah. least. Uh, there there are very few things that separate a uh, a nation state from a from another cult, or a ma even a mafia like organization. Uh, and it, it, it's 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 sort of uh, it's sort of scary to admit these things publicly <laughs> because <laughs> because uh, you're not, I don't think you're really allowed to have have these opinions and it yeah I guess uh, well speak speaking of schools uh, I, I as as you know from bef both know from before I used to work on a tall ship and that was actually a school. Uh, uh, high, high school kids so so there was a lot of teachers on board and I get got to see how how the public school worked from from inside a lot and uh, I, I, I wasn't very happy with what I saw I saw it become more and more politicized 
every year yeah. I was there, and more politically correct. And we we went to places like Morocco, uh, and uh, the kids were uh, assigned uh, uh, a task like going ashore and uh, interviewing the locals about what they thought about different things, and all the questions were, "What do you think of gay rights and gay marriage and like uh, all this?" <laughs> in Morocco where, where people are very religious and get very offended by this and I, I thought it was so unnecessary to like uh, to, to, to like try to push this uh, uh, liberal agenda uh, on on the kids and uh, from the kids to to wherever uh, they went uh, ashore and like push this narrative on onto whoever they interacted with and I, I, I really didn't like that and, and, and the school became more and more of that and less and less critical uh, thinking um, as the years went by yeah, yeah. like this uh, the loudness of the political correctness uh, in the Swedish society seems to me to be pretty extreme and uh, I think yeah, it's, it's bizarre I think it's really loud here in Norway too, but Sweden is totally next level. Yeah, and it's so sad because uh, it fuels the uh, the divide between uh, between people and like uh, yeah. yeah. And I say I'd, I'd say it's potentially dangerous too if you have because it's not like small uh, parts of the. Uh, society in Sweden uh, disagrees with this. I, I would guess pretty big parts of society in Sweden disagrees with this uh, official yeah. political correctness. And what happens if the, when the public discourse completely censors and like demonizes uh, the other side of that argument, then it must lead to, as you say, a huge divide and a huge amount of frustration and anger, I would say, in society. Of course. And this is why the Sweden Democrats are... Uh, are are going larger and larger every every year yeah uh, and i believe it's uh, i think it's kind of sad because i i don't think it's the immigrants fault <laughs> no <laughs> everything in society i don't uh, i i don't agree with their their way of framing what the problem is i, I mean because they're also very pro state and uh, like they yeah. want to go back to an old social democratic type of sweden which 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 i think is is the, is the prog is the problem to begin with uh, like uh, uh but the public discourse being completely different from uh, like the public opinion being completely different from what what the media says is a big problem mm -hmm. uh, uh what what would we do without bitcoin Knut? <laughs> yeah that's the, yeah, what, what i would <laughs> something i i tell myself uh, every day but uh yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'm, I'm just Can gonna I ask. Yes, yeah, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would be uh, uh, a much less hopeful uh, libertarian, I yeah. guess. Same. Uh, a closeted libertarian. I mean, l like I've been saying before, uh, mm -hmm. I think this is uh, we should stop focusing on on politics because it's all a charade anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And like uh, focus on on you. What tools do we actually have to liberate ourselves and start? Start with the individual. I start with you. Uh, yeah. Here, here. <laughs> so yeah. How, so um, how do you? I've been thinking a lot. You know, first of all, let's talk about your book. Um, um, a few shout outs in advance. Um, it's a beautiful forward, or what do you call it, prelude, by Hodlin out, and the the aft uh, the afterward or epilogue is by um, uh, um, a prince, right? Daniel Prince of the yeah. Once Bitten podcast, and the cover is by Fractal Encrypt. Yep. Okay. Shout out to them. Really excellent book, and uh, and I knew, you know, I know that you could have gone into every fucking possible tangent over here, and I and you 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 deliberately, I think made it short like 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 compact and short for you know the average person out there the average noob to just grasp and be inspired and ask himself the question or what's the call to action here uh, I mainly made it short because I ran out of time to write it <laughs> and 
and having write, having written two books on Bitcoin now, or 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 three if you count the first uh, prototype, uh, I, I'm sort of I'm sort of fed up writing books on Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that now, and the, you can only say the same things so many times. I mean, it's worth repeating, and it's worth like trying to get the message out. But, uh, and I think the two books together they complement each other well, so you, you can view them as one book uh, or a two part, maybe the, <laughs> the Old and the New Testament <laughs> for, for Bitcoin atheism. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's a good complementary. The first one, sovereignty through uh, mathematics, yes. right? Yeah. And yeah, and uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Hodlonot once again for writing that wonderful forward, and uh, and for uh, letting me write articles for his fantastic magazine. Oh my God! Uh, thanks so much for what you have contributed to Citadel Twenty One. Uh, those two articles are amazing, in my opinion. Really cool and. Uh, the two of us uh, knows that there is one. Uh, we have one in the pipeline too, right? Yeah, yeah, we have, we have a hardcore one coming up. <laughs> really enjoy those articles. Yeah. Really, it's, it's short, compact, concise, but it you know it like like cuts cuts through the butter, you know, like a hot yeah. knife. Um, and, uh, for me, it's easier to write articles than to write books, and for really? everyone, I guess, but because, mm -hmm. because when I write an article, I just I get into flow mode, mm -hmm. and. When it's done, it's done. It's there's not that much to it. Uh, yeah. You have an idea and you write it down, and that's it. When when you're writing a book, you have to be concise and like structured and more. Uh, writing articles is more a stream of consciousness, than mm -hmm. like lightning in a bottle thing. Yeah, there's less less need for structure and less need for uh, like the tie everything together part. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So before I prepared this thumbnail, I asked uh, Knut, <laughs> what kind of title, does he have any idea, suggestion for a title? And, you know, we were like back and forth and he was like, I don't know, I, I took him seriously. And he said, uh, why did you just you know, call it uh, Ren and Stimpy show? <laughs> not <a lot>. So <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not even sure am I allowed to, to show this, uh, but anyway, it doesn't matter. You just, just Google Ren and Stimpy, yeah, it's really hilarious. Show it, show it. Show it, okay, okay. <laughs> let, me, let me show this, it's, it's hilarious. So this is what it looks like, one of the images I found. Yeah, that's me and Hodlo not all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, and I thought the no, random Stimpy of Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, it's about it's a show. It's about experience, the both of you. So, I mean, I have a bunch of questions, Knut, in connection with your book. So, I wanted you know to have both of your like uh, thoughts, you know, flow of thoughts, uh, position, where you stand. Um, do you want to like proceed like that, or do you? Do you have any like uh, you know something you want to like get off your chest before we start? Uh, not really. I th I think I've introduced myself on so many other pods now and where I stand and stuff. So you, like, just ask the questions. That's fine with me. Okay, yeah, it sounds good to me. Okay. What really you know um, <clears throat> inspires me or 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 makes me think all the time is is this. Um, and this is something we have we we constantly you know have to think about when it comes to Bitcoin. It's the rate of speed or the exponentiality, the the function of exponentiality, the exponential function, the exponential process, the exponential evolution, technological development. When it comes to exponentiality, it's something we cannot really fathom or imagine, understand. Even like risk assessment, you know, we can. It's like cigarette smoking, you know, like you know, uh, cigarette uh, corporations they buy, you know, they 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 study the behavior behavior, emotions of, of children, even down to three, five years old in the 70s even. And we can't like imagine or comprehend the risks, the danger of maybe today, tomorrow in one year. And the same thing, you know, uh, on the other hand is, is exponential function or uh, technological development. And you, you know, you, you illustrate it pretty good. You know, you say, uh, for example, when it comes to technologies such as, you know, like uh, Pokemon, you know, this this game. When when did it occur? Like in the eighties or nineties or something? Uh, Pokemon, uh, where fifty million people downloaded it within shortest period of time, or the mobile phone or something like that. What is what is? I want to hear you both both of your thoughts. Like, what is it that um, 
is it can we visualize or can we make it more more understandable the exponential function of a of a development of technology of adoption rate um the one of my favorite quotes uh, is from a guy called Albert Allen Bartlett, and he said that the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. Uh, yeah. And I think this is true for most humans. We, ha we have a very hard time grasping uh, exponentiality and what, uh, how that really works. If, like the famous example is with the um, uh, the Hindu god that uh, uh, asked for a, a, a piece of rice uh, uh, on on a chessboard and to double double the amount of rice uh, f for each uh, um, square on the chessboard, uh, which would like if you do that sixty four times, uh, you end up with like two decimeters of rice covering entire. <laughs> The entirety of India, and uh, people people have a hard time seeing what this is and what this does. And the exponentiality of of Bitcoin adoption uh, sort of works like that. There's something called Metcalfe's law, uh, which states that the uh, value of a communications network is equal to the number of users squared. Uh, and if you see Bitcoin in this way. Uh, the 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 how, how this connects to the price and the halvings and and everything makes me believe that this can take off much faster than we think it than we think it can and it can it, it's it's not an unlikely scenario that it would go to like ten million dollars per bitcoin in, in just a matter of months yeah this could very well play out one day and uh, i i don't know when and i don't know how and i don't know like the the, the really tricky part is to know the 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 time frame and this like how long stuff takes i mean it already has uh, uh grown by s so many percent like in the first years and the, the last if if you see the, what the price of, Bit of a Bitcoin has been from 2009 up until now, it's hard to, maybe hard to imagine that it, it can do the same thing and, and more again. But then again, history tells us that, uh, that people, have, people have been having a hard time realizing how, how powerful this thing is uh, every t before every boom or bull run. Yeah. And I, I think the the nature of the of an exponential function, like from a from a human standpoint, is that uh, from any specific vantage point, you will go from the the phenomenon being completely insignificant and uh, not worthy of notice to absolutely overwhelming in a very abrupt manner. Yeah. Uh, so that's the gradually, gradually, then suddenly meme. Like, uh, for example, the you mentioned the the chessboard uh, metaphor with the rice. I also like the metaphor of I think it's the the giant stadium, the baseball stadium, and someone drops a drop of water in the middle of the stadium, and then uh, every second uh, that those amounts of drops are doubled, so we get two drops, the second seconds, four drops, the next one. I mean, this is for a long time you're not seeing anything out there it's just like you know at some point uh, but suddenly there is a small puddle and from the moment you start uh, I think there was something about the water started reaching where like the bench the benches of the players and from that point until everyone in the stadium is drowned it's like super fast and seemingly immediate so uh, as I was saying initially like from 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 where you observe the phenomenon, it will seem like nothing was happening, and then everything was happening in a very sh short manner of time. Yeah. Uh, that that stadium, like the last two seconds, it will be half full and then full, right? Ex exactly. <laughs> so that only takes one second. So it's yeah, it's really bizarre. Uh, yeah. 
Mm. Uh, let me let me just say you emphasize Knut in your book one point. I want to know both of your thoughts. You say that the more like it goes to the root, to you know, to the structural transformational stuff, it's much harder. It takes a little bit longer, at least from our ex human experience or historical experience, to adopt. When something like you know whatever that was, you know, a mobile phone or Pokemon, you know, it gets like adopted really fast and i just listened to peter till's speeches he's really great great speeches he, he's done i mean there are yeah. some aspects where i don't really agree because he goes into religions again and of and faith it's all good you know it's all good um and because you know i'm i'm, I'm totally like un, un unreligious but um he says that it's funny it's weird you know when you look like information technology computer technology um you know uh, even ai you know machine learning all that stuff computers and it's you see like a tremendous you know exponential growth and and development but he says what about uh you don't see you don't see that uh, that exponential development in any other sector like whatever with the you know the trains uh the trains the, the you know the transportation systems the energy or you know i'm just i mean i could think a lot of a lot of aspects where it's either wherever you know suppressed in closet or just uh, ignored so how do you explain that um yeah matt Carl's law explains that quite well <laughs> i mean uh the the internet is just people that are connected and the more people that connect to it the uh, the, the better it becomes exponentially or sort of exponentially and uh, like <laughs> What was the example with a train a train line i mean if you connect one more city uh you connect more people but you don't necessarily uh, that that's that's that doesn't necessarily lead to exponential growth it's just it's very linear to just add another train line i, I mean uh, yeah, yeah i would think <laughs> like speaking of trains and air travel and stuff like that it's also like the sunk cost of infrastructure i would think like it's mm -hmm. impossible you need uh, huge amounts of infrastructure to run these systems and then it's even if uh, the foundational technology has developed a lot uh, you're not like societies are not able to put the required amount of resources to upgrade the whole infrastructure network in in tandem with the technological advancement i guess no uh, norway has great problems there because it's all uh... <laughs> it's all mountains and uh sure. and uh, uh huge trenches in the sea right so you have to have tunnels and uh, bridges everywhere yeah so many uh, actually some amazing tunnels i was vacationing in the west of norway a couple of weeks yeah. ago and uh, we have some really badass tunnel projects that's been developed yeah, yeah beautiful beautiful place in the world yeah. <laughs> um about infrastructure um i lost i lost my train of thought <laughs> yeah yeah i was i was trying to get like to you know what peter thiel also talks about zero to one one to many where it's also in uh, uh elaborated on by safida namus on page 96 to 98 where it con con uh, compares the 20th century and a gold standard in connection with low time preference or lowest time pre preference and the you know the the, the the criminal fiat system with its high pr high time preference and we had like in the 20th century or 19th century more original like original innovations from zero to one and later on in the 20th and uh, it's more like optimization improvements like you know one too many so this is where i'm getting at it's like not only like trains but like transportation like what about energy uh, energy conversion technologies uh tr like like without burning fuels for example you know it's not like infrastructure i'm, I'm really talking about like technology like like you know like we have computer chips that are every 18 months uh, like you, if you read Jeff Booth's uh, "The Price of Tomorrow: Why Deflation Is the Key to an Abundant Future," you you understand that oh my God, you know this is this is exponential. This is by order of magnitude. So if you extrapolate that development into every other sector, energy conversion, transportation, with this be whatever magnetical, whatever trains or um, or, or magnetic gravitational plasma technology, sub nuclear technology. Uh, uh, or whatever genetics uh biogenetic you know what i'm saying this I'm, I'm talking about like zero to one technology technological innovations 
<laughs> was there a question in there? Yeah, but you mean to, you mean to ask why that's not occurring yeah, I'm, I'm on, the, yeah. on, on the same yeah. level as oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, and tie it in with Bitcoin. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I would I would tend to think that uh, that regulation may have uh, like the ever increasing amount of regulation that's occurring, and but uh, the name that comes to mind when you talk about this is Elon Musk uh, and how that man alone has been able to do some some pretty zero to one things, I would say, like uh, <laughs> Tesla and SpaceX in their respective fields uh, have basically done stuff that was, I would not have considered uh, possible for uh, for one man's vision to, to make that happen. And uh, so it does happen, but what I, I'm, I'm really not sure why we, we're not seeing more Elon Musk's. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah. yeah, and yeah. Uh, don't forget yeah. about he started PayPal with Peter Thiel. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, but, even but, yeah. so, what you what you guys think? Do, do, do you think Elon only has zero point twenty five Bitcoin? <laughs> oh, he's got, a lot I'm, def more. I'm definitely yeah, he's yeah, got yeah. a stash he's not stupid so the guy knows no, exactly no. what his heart is absolute scarcity yeah he's super yeah, he's, smart a guy yeah, and it's, you know it's just observing it yeah so why, why doesn't he wanna why doesn't he wanna get more involved do you think let me tell you my my theory a little bit because i mean i respect elon musk greatly like i, I respect peter thiel for their knowledge, the wisdom, their innovative, you know, spirit. But there's something when it comes, maybe it doesn't have to do with this question, with the specific question you're asking, but it's like sometimes, you know, when he, whenever he's on an interview with Joe Rogan talking about artificial intelligence, like years ago, he warned about, oh, you know, artificial intelligence could be, could become dangerous yeah. and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. then he's like, um, you know, let's not pretend or let's not be naive. I mean, Elon Musk is with one foot, whether, whether he wants to or not with one foot, in the military industrial complex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He gets funding from the government, from the Department of Defense, from Pentagon, whatever, yeah, 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 from yeah, yeah. whatever that is. And, uh, so he can't uh, talk about it really openly, you know, like yeah, if not, really... not only that, uh, mm -hmm. not only that, but uh, he's uh, being a celebrity of that order of magnitude, like requires you to be politically correct. In, uh, like, when he smoked a joint on Joe Rogan's uh, show, the, the Tesla stock dropped by <laughs> <laughs> by like fifteen percent. So he really needs to uh, to his, consider his actions. Okay. His, his balls are really big, though. I'm 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 continuously impressed by how he like pushes the boundary and says a lot of pretty. He likes to poke the hornet's nest too. So yeah, he does. Maybe one yeah. maybe yeah. maybe one day we'll uh, we'll see him get behind Bitcoin in a big way. Yeah. Uh, who knows? But you're right, you, uh, Knut, you're right. Uh, Elon Musk got to be careful, I think. I mean, if I were him, to be honest with you, I think it's not easy to be, to be in his skin because I would be careful, you know, what, what I would say in the public, especially, you know, when you're one foot into some technological stuff that is sort of classified or if you signed up, you know, non-disclosure agreements or whatever, you know, national security mm -hmm. issues. So you can't really talk about it openly. You can't you can talk about it, but in more in a general sense. You can't go like, okay. you know, this is my theory, but who knows? What do I know? Yes. Uh, speaking of what, uh, you said something about regulation, hold or not, uh, uh, stifling exponential growth in other sectors than, uh, than uh, internet, the internet sectors. Yeah. Uh, th this, this ties into a thing I've been thinking about when when, when thinking about what to talk to you guys about, and that is the differences between Norway and Sweden in how we tackled the COVID crisis, and how how Norway was very police statey from from day one, uh, while Sweden was was not not mm -hmm. at all, and uh, uh, and I I think like the thing you said about regulations is uh, there's a saying that the the ex the bureaucracy is expanding to meet the needs of the expanding bureaucracy. And I think that happens a lot in those huge oil companies, for instance, that that, that sort of runs your country. Uh, uh, I, I know from personal experience about huge energy companies and huge sh shipping companies and how, how bureaucratic their health and safety organizations can be and how many bureaucrats there are just inventing more and more rules and regulations for everything 
Uh, and I think it, there was a lot of pressure from that sector and from those guys when COVID happened. Uh, I have a friend who works with uh, a company called Flotel, I believe, who has hotels for provides hotels for oil rigs, uh, accommodation for all oil rigs, and they they had an oil rig that was completely locked down for two weeks, and nobody could get on or off uh, from it, and no one could even leave their own cabin. So they were they were. Uh, uh, literally uh, in in isolation for two weeks they could take like five minute walks twice a day and they got their meals to their cabin door like <laughs> slide it in under the door and so, so it's a, it has been really draconic over there from yeah uh, and this is completely opposite from the the approach we've taken and uh, I'm very happy that Sweden didn't take these draconic measures but rather trusted everyone to make their own decisions which uh, of course didn't work that well from a, a death rate perspective but then again as you've pointed out many times the the the, the median death rate for uh, covid patients is the same as uh, as the average death rate uh, age yeah. in the country uh, like is it 82 is it 82 or yeah, something yeah something yeah. like that mm -hmm. so uh, and i believe that we our government sort of had to have this liberal approach to it simply because they don't have the they don't have the power to lock the, the country down uh the the, the police are uh, underfunded and like they have uh, so much else with gang criminality and organized crime and stuff to take care of and uh <laughs> like how do you stop these these no-go zones in Sweden. How do, how do you stop families of 20 people living together from interacting with each other? And stuff? I mean, it was, would be a lot harder for 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 governments to uh, for the government to uh, to impose such things here than in Norway. I mean, in, in Norway, it's, you're yeah, every, everything the government decides here. They have all the resources they need to enforce it. Yeah, uh, because you're rich. Even if, yeah, even if it's like small things, it will be enforced. So uh, that's that's probably a thing. But I also heard that there are very different traditions in Norway and Sweden on how, basically, how uh, governments are run uh, and how how you, in in which extent you listen to experts. And I think there is, from what I read, there is a much bigger tradition in Sweden to actually listen to the. To the like the fields of expertise, like in this case the ep epidemiologist uh, experts, yes. uh, which you actually listened to. You took the scientific approach and you listened to to the experts in the field. Norway did not do that. Uh, no. We took a completely different approach, but still we have to. I mean, speaking of draconian, we we haven't really seen hardcore draconian stuff in Norway at all, com like compared to Spain and uh, no, no, and Italy, of course. So. We have only seen like uh, basically uh, no one has been uh, denied going out to their house. We've seen pretty large scale shutdowns of uh, restaurants and gyms and stuff like that. Schools, schools were shut down, which was pretty bad. But uh, I think still we are among the best in the world uh, in regards of not losing liberties. We had quite push a big pushback actually against proposed uh, draconian laws from the government. So. <clears throat> But why is that? Why why is that hard? Is it because is it could it be that really less corrupt or you know have a more libertarian mindset or you know are more really rational uh, and scientific? Or? Norwegian society is uh, it's very it's very it, it loves its freedoms very and values freedom very highly. We have a lot of lot of stuff uh, in place, uh, a lot of uh, like uh, bodies in place to protect the privacy to protect the basic. Uh, basic uh, rights basically so the moment uh, the, the government proposed this first proposal of the corona law which was very draconian they could basically just make up laws on their own and suspend laws on their own they got huge pushback and had to like back down from it yeah but I, but I just want to before before i forget you said initially this thing about the average age of the dead in sweden and it just baffles me that people are still like when I tried to say that Sweden succeeded because you guys seem to like you you did not uh, set precedents to remove basic liberties 
and you you preserve that, which is huge. It's basically like you chose to not be Ethereum at the DAO hack. You didn't like roll back uh, your, your liberties uh, from some from some bullshit uh, pun pun intended. <laughs> yeah, from from some bullshit pandemic hack. But uh, which I, I think was really great. But we have to. The average age of the dead in Sweden is 82, and the average expected life span is 82. So then, if you have 2,900 dead, or how many dead you have, and you can multiply, like, we have to think about how many expected life years did we lose here? And actually, if didn't we do that. this little, little bit cynical math, but actually we didn't lose any expected life years in Sweden. If the if the average age of the dead had been 40 years old, it would have been horrible. Then we had lost 42 years per person. Yes. That, that would be like 2,900 times 40, uh, which would be a completely different story. So the, the fact yeah. that, that we are even discussing these numbers of dead without going behind the numbers is just so ridiculous. Yes. And uh, just to uh, continue on, on this uh, thought thread here, uh, there's another aspect of this, and the, the economic aspect, of course, uh, mm -hmm. which with, when you say listen to experts, the, the thing they listen to is the health experts and the mm -hmm. vi virologists and everything. No one listens to economists. And they're like, you can't really stop an ecosystem for three months and expect it to be uh, yeah. alive and well. Yeah. Uh, like, and if you view eco the the economy of a society, like, if time really is money, then lifetime is money. And then a 30% tax on the population is like stealing 30% of the, that person's lifetime. Yeah. And so that is a partial death sentence. You can yeah. view it as that. Yeah. And and if, you, if you're this hardcore in your arguments, or at least, at least if you admit that there's a connection between ruining someone's economy and uh, and life i mean there's more to life than just not dying yeah. <laughs> uh, this, the, should, the, this should be apparent but uh, uh, it seems it's not yeah no it's and it's kind of sad yeah i mean we we made a personal choice to uh, to quarantine ourselves for for a couple of months uh, uh, I have a close family member that is in a, a risk group, and we chose to uh, chose to like remove our kids from school, even mm -hmm. though we weren't really allowed to. Mm -hmm. And and I have to admit that I I did it part partially because of COVID, but also because I wanted to remove my kids from the school because I could. <laughs> like uh, when my when my daughter started her first year in school, there was a big gathering on the playground outside and they said this year we're going to focus extra on the climate and we're going to teach the kids how to be climate smart and uh, buy less plastic bags and use less plastic straws and all this virtue signaling bullshit politics that are all over the place now. it's like yeah. and i i didn't really want that for my kids <laughs> to be honest so it was a no-brainer to new... just work from home and yeah. The new normal is to not hug anyone, not shake anyone's hand, and to drink your uh, Coca-Cola out of a paper straw that leaks uh, <laughs> leaks uh, soda everywhere. Yeah, what <laughs> what what are paper straws? They all don't about? work. They don't no, work. No, no, no. Of course they don't. They're made of paper. But they were mass produced already. Come on, guys. Ah, <laughs> uh, the world is so disappointing sometimes. Yeah. Thank God for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let me ask you because I'm curious about Norway. Okay, what else is different or like like super unique about Sweden and or Norway? Uh, now, aside you know from COVID approach and is there anything like from from you know mindset or uh, mentality, attitude, disposition? I think uh, um, I think I would say Norway and Sweden are probably pretty similar in many ways. Uh, mm -hmm. I think last 10, 20 years, a difference has developed in that Norwegians have become more, uh, some of their initiative has probably been taken away from them because we have such good welfare uh, system. Uh, good, I would not say it's, uh, I would say it's like excessive and uh, takes away yeah. 
takes away initiative. And I think yeah. since because of our oil, basically, and our focus on social justice, then it's it's basically not possible to fall out of the of the net, so to say. So, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's that is the case in Sweden, since Sweden doesn't have the oil. So I guess uh, at least I see young Swedes coming to Norway with a really good uh, attitude to want to work and also taking jobs that maybe Norwegian uh, young people don't want. Yeah. Uh, so, but similarities between these societies, I think there is very high levels of trust. Uh, Dangerous, dangerously high. Dangerously high, high levels of trust, uh, totally like. We have both of the countries have state broadcasting channels, which uh, basically function as uh, purveyors of truth, at least in Norway, and I think so in yeah, Sweden as well. Like Swedish very much. S SVT and in Sweden and NRK in Norway, basically like if if it's reported there, then it's then it becomes true for most Norwegians, I would say. Yes, and they're very left wing tilted. Very left Norway wing. And very Sweden. left wing. So they're they're. They're they're running the narrative, and yeah. and like as I write in the article there about up, we had only state-run media channels. We had nothing else. There was like two channels on TV that was state-owned, and uh, three mm -hmm. channels on the radio, and that's it. And then we had a couple of like newspapers, all subsidized by the government. Uh, that system is still in play. They. Uh, they, they very recently they they removed the the fee for owning a TV, and turned that into a tax instead. So so the, the Sveriges Radio, as it's called, where the, where the uh, the public radio and TV channels, they cost us uh, how much is it? Like eight billion euros a year. Jesus, that's so fucking ridiculous! I can't yes, believe that. Yes, yes, and they tell us at the same time as uh, as they tell us we need eight billion to make uh, to make lame ass journalism. Uh, we're we're in a crisis. So, so we're we're in a crisis here. We have organized crime and we have this virus and everything, but we're still able to give subsidies to cultural workers and like fund the theater and uh, and uh, run an uh, 8 billion euro state funded uh, skewed narrative news channel i mean yeah we I have a yeah I can, we have propaganda. a similar yeah we have a similar discussion going on in austria and germany too about like people paying uh, I mean, I don't have uh, radio or television for decades now. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to, you know, uh, uh, let 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 people, no. you know, uh, you know, uh, th garbage me uh, and with all this bullshit. So and people, you know, are paying like twenty, thirty. I don't know how much it di differs from one state to another in Austria. Like you have to pay a fee, right, for all this bullshit uh, the gar garbage they're producing. You know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, but in Sweden it's taxed now, so everyone mm -hmm. has to pay for it. So and and the uh, and they buy series from from other uh, media companies like they bought Game of Thrones to show it on the national t television and and they buy sports events for b billions and billions of, of kronas uh, just to show them and like I don't watch soccer I think it's boring but I still have to pay for fucking soccer. <laughs> I, I don't I don't get it. And and the Eurovision Song Contest. Like I'm sorry, I'm not gay. Uh, I I bet I bet you people people enjoy it a lot. But if they want to see it they could pay for it themselves. I mean, I'm sure there's a market for the Eurovision Song Contest without it being subsidized. Uh, I don't get it. Are we in a crisis or not? <laughs> We're in a deep crisis. We're in a deep social, <laughs> structural, uh, psychological, emotional. Seriously, we are we are in a deep crisis. But you know, I'm, I don't know why, but I'm really optimistic, like never before. The the more time goes by, the more bullshit I see, the all this chaos and disruptions and and you know money printing on trillions and trillions. It's not, I don't know why, but why I'm so excited and still so optimistic. And I'm by the way, I mean I already told you, uh, some of my guests already. I'm becoming father. We're expecting a child, so this is why Bitcoin has become more. Yeah, Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, we are expecting a daughter, and this is why Bitcoin has become you know not only you know for for now so many years now. I mean, at least two or three years, but uh, 
it's become sort of not only my conviction, but, but my ethos, you know, my mission too, because what kind of world, what kind of space, what kind of civilization, society, you know, do I want our daughter to, to grow up with? And this is, this is why, you know, we, yeah, we should talk about Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what kind of path do we want to put our kids on? Like, uh, it would be so difficult to, to even like recommend uh, or explain a path for them if we didn't have a, some kind of uh, uh, sound uh, f uh, foundation to, to build stuff on. Yeah, and a coherent narrative about yeah, what exactly. it's all about. Exactly. All this, there's so everything is just uh, full of cognitive dissonance. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this. yeah. And it's so funny because us three guys, we don't. We don't know each other from before, and we're uh, from completely different backgrounds and completely different, different uh, parts of the world. And yeah. we agree on like 99% of, of everything we talk about. Pretty much because because we have this because we have this this thing now to anchor our ideas to. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Was that your cat? No, that was my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Space mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, Another space I, I, told, <laughs> I told her I will be busy for an hour, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I really don't care whether they're going to ban cash because I was going to just ask a transition to this next question of mine in Sweden, Norway, wherever. Is, is there a tendency to, or because I know in Germany and Austria too, there is a heavy use of cash still. People are still, you know, yeah. you know for good reason, of course, you know, but what, what, is it, what does it look like? Like, uh, do you see like whatever this fucked up central bank digital currency, like banning cash and, you know, coming with also come up special drawing bullshit, you know? Sweden is uh, best in class on banning cash, uh, aren't they, Knut? Yeah, yeah, we are. And it's it's uh, it's really scary. We have this uh, phone payment system called Swish, so we swish each other uh, uh, small sums of money. Yeah. And uh, the, according to a, an, a journalist I know, uh, Swish is actually safer to use than regular bank payments or credit cards because the the banks uh, the, there's more privacy in Swish since uh, and it's harder for institutions to get information about each transaction from the Swiss network than from uh, f from a bank to bank transfer. Oh, really? Uh, so, so okay. in that way, it's better. But, but it has been going down. It, it's like all of a sudden it's on the news. Swiss is down. I'm like, why is Swiss down? Or bank ID is down. We have a system called Bank ID, where you can uh, uh, and but and that goes down from time to time. And of yeah. course it's vulnerable and like last year I had to fill in a form for my uh, uh, bank account my, where, where I get my salary and I had to state what the account was for and if there were any other incomes than uh, my, uh, my uh, monthly salary and like who I was intending to pay and like all sorts of this KYC bullshit stuff that they they're going to box you in, and if you, if you if you by any chance get a bit richer, a bit quicker than than what's allowed, you will get the tax authorities on you uh, like instantly. So it's yeah. and they and they do it all uh, under and they say we have to do this to uh, in order to. Uh, uh, stop people from washing money or, or doing economical crimes. What, whatever the hell an economic crime is. I mean, <laughs> if if central banking isn't one, what the hell is? What yeah, the hell is? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you made know. a pretty, you made a pretty good point in your book. You said something like, I'm paraphrasing, you said something like, once institutions and bureaucrats are established, you know, and, and like, you know, yeah. part of the integral, they, they will come up with all kinds of, you know, s s the most stupid, like, justifications, excuses to, you know, keep this shit going on. Yeah. Yes, something like that. Milton, th th this, this is from way back, uh, Milton Friedman has said this in uh, very uh, explanatory ways in, in the free to choose documentary from the 70s. Uh, uh, 
and of course both Mises, Mises and Rod, Rothbard and those guys has been onto it also like uh, if an institution is in place uh, you can't really it's very hard to uh, to abandon an institution once it's in place and uh, here in Sweden we have like more than 500 governmental uh, institutions and uh, uh, there was one for like gender equality programs in Goth the Gothenburg area for medium-sized companies or something that, yeah. that they wanted to shut down and they just yeah. couldn't do it yeah. because there are like 20 people working there and they have their salaries and everything yeah. so uh, and it's uh, and it is completely unnecessary of course mm. uh, like uh, uh, <laughs> yeah and it's depressing because uh, you, you can't really do anything about it. It's it's the same thing with salaries. Everybody expects to get have a salary raise every year because of because of inflation, I guess. Yeah. Oh. Bureaucracy has a tendency to grow like a tumor. It seems so yeah, it does. inevitable. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, like when I worked as teacher, I saw that uh, from the years I worked, it became so much worse because like all the time uh, bureaucrats are experts at uh, legitimizing their own existence and uh, not even that but also experts at making up uh, new positions in in themselves to like fact check with their own bullshit or something and we, the time i worked uh, we, suddenly we had this these new bureaucratic uh, things that uh, we had to report to because they were kind of like you know that it was put in place checks on that the teachers did what they were supposed to do so we suddenly ended up spending half of our time reporting to these bureaucrats that were supposed to check that we were doing things by the book mm. and then you need more teachers and you need even more bureaucrats to check those teachers and it's just an, a never-ending cycle <laughs> of more bureaucracy. yeah i know yeah my, my wife is a teacher and the the amount of time uh she spends actually teaching someone some something is is just insignificant compared yeah. to all the rest of the bullshit she has to do yeah. it's really yeah. bullshit yeah mm -hmm. uh, and and it's really depressing because how are kids supposed to learn anything from from a school uh, yeah. when the system is like that it's i mean it's really depressing it's basically um, back to what you said about regulation initially like how uh, regulation is a filter and uh, like uh, how it uh, makes it harder to innovate and to it basically removes bandwidth from the person trying to do something and yeah. uh, I think I have to draw that parallel to what we are doing with Citadel 21 that uh, we actually try to remove all kinds of filter or regulation on on the submissions we get there because that's opposite to what we're trying to do we, we want the actual raw content and not some filtered or editorial policy version of it that's that's excellent you should you should treasure that ethos <laughs> like <laughs> yeah never never abandon that thought <laughs> yeah i think it's super important to get basically to get shit done and to to get the actual the actual signal that's inside of people translated into something manifestable then you can't spend huge amounts of your effort trying to trying to obey a lot of dogma around what you're trying to do mm -hmm. no. what about i mean um in norway uh, do you now besides inflation do you guys have negative rates or or knut do you guys have negative rates already like in some countries yeah, in had, germany yeah they had never negative rates for a while uh, i don't know if it's negative now okay. um because I don't have a TV, <laughs> but uh, uh, negative there, rates a... haven't hit the consumers here in Norway mm -hmm. yet, in a big no. way at least. Uh, but uh, they are yeah. there higher up in the hierarchy. Well, they have hit the consumer indirectly. Yeah, true. Uh, but 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 we're not like paying negative interest rates on on paper. Not, Bas not like ba that. Basically, if you have uh, have an account, you will have zero zero. You won't get any uh, interest, but uh, you'll have to pay some fees. Yeah. So it's like Same here. practically mm -hmm. negative, I would say. Mm -hmm. So when 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 you explain like in your environment, people like when it comes like to the basic essence of like the fundamental essence of Bitcoin, 
We often talk about, you know, about like store of value, and you, know, you elaborate on that really a super, uh, Knut, in your book about store of value, medium exchange, you know, uh, to, to, to make people comprehend. Would it be easy, do you think, to talk only about, like, purchasing power? Like, when you buy something, you, you can uh, buy just more, you know? It's maybe uh, people have, have a hard time, because we never learned anything, you know, in school or, you know, let alone, you know, universities or anything about what is the store of value, you know? Number go up technology. That's, that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, that's the tricky part. Like to onboard someone into Bitcoin, you need to you you need them to start thinking about money first, and no, almost no one does. So uh, of normies. So 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 it, it's a hard, it's a hard pill to swallow. I mean, there are people that like you introduce them to. Uh, friends of mine that I introduced to Bitcoin like years ago and gave them some or sold them some or whatever and uh, they've been having them ever since but they're just not interested in them and I don't know why people are a, a lot of people are just doing their jobs and that's that's yeah. really their their whole identity they, they do the, their jobs and they go to work 9 to 5 and never stop to to think twice about things and unfortunately that's the world we, world we live in and uh, the, the times that they do think out of their boxes they virtue signal something mm -hmm. link they link to something you know, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez said or Greta Sundberg said or like some bullshit like that and <laughs> like it's not uh, <laughs> It's not very easy to get people to think about uh, about money. I mean, uh, that's my next question about dependency. I mean, hold on out. What's your thoughts? Like, is that is that because of dependency, interdependency from the system? The people are already so indoctrinated; they they can't just you know understand like what is what's at stake here because they don't feel the pain points. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting topic. It seems to me like. I'm, like there are basically types, archetypes of people or archetypes of ways of if it's the consciousness we inhabit or if it's uh, character or whatever it is. But what we said earlier that for some reason, the three of us who have never spoken together seem to get along and agree on a lot of things. And uh, why is that? I think it's because uh, we have some kind of desire for uh, truth uh, or call it an aversion for bullshit. Ex and, uh, yeah. and we have uh, uh, basically uh, people spouting bullshit is very offensive to me. I think it's just horrible to see grown people just sitting there not dealing with first principles and not like having any kind of uh, accountability basically in what they're saying and meaning. I think it's just it's very sad and shocking almost to see how how yeah. prev prevalent this is. It's depressing. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I think it's it's uh, probably uh, very uh, uh, what should I say scary for people to take it upon themselves to actually yeah. form your own opinion. It's so much safer to to follow the the official narrative and maybe it even boils down to you know fear of being kicked out of the herd or something like mm -hmm. some kind of very reptile uh, fear of uh, not belonging yeah, and not yeah. not an entirely ungrounded fear i mean people yeah. have been fired for not being politically correct it's, it's that, not, that happens it's, all the time it, it's not ungrounded at all i mean if you go out on the on the town in stockholm or oslo and you sit down and you you speak out against uh, against the stunning and brave virtue signaling of AOC or Greta Thunberg, then you you will be completely uh, wrecked and basically thrown out of the social group or ridiculed yeah. or you know harassed basically. This is this is the how it is on the ground in at, at least in Norway and I would think in Sweden as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's better on the countryside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. To be honest with you, I'd rather be in the jungle or I don't know, my, have my own forest or something. Um, but you know, uh, Knut, you talk about like on page seventy-eight about lack of imagination, and your title is Bitcoin uh, uh, um, in, uh, um, Independence Reimagined. 
yeah. does comprehension comes first, like holistic comprehension and then imagination? Or is it because of the lack of imagination people can, I don't know, you know, like, well, what's, what's your position on, on, on the title too? How, do you, how did you pick the title? Like, but imagination. Uh, the, the the title connects to like how we we need to uh, t t if we want our personal freedoms back we need to reimagine what that what that entails and uh, like what what we we will never reach those individualistic goals by political means so we need to reimagine the entire thing and focus on the tools instead that's basically the story. There's no specific story behind that title, uh, but 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 it is it sort of en encapsulates what I how I how I view Bitcoin. I view it as a tool uh, for mm -hmm. personal emancipation, for lack of a better word, uh, or individual freedoms. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you you use it to to gain a little, and, and not only the currency but the whole. The whole ethos and the 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 ecosystem and like the I hate the word but the community uh, the, there's so much here that that can and so many open doors that can uh, that can give you a a new way of of seeing your own life and like yeah uh, and yeah so that's basically the story behind the title and mm -hmm. uh, yeah I talk about people's lack of imagination and. Uh, this is a huge problem. As, uh, it will take a long time for a lot of people to, to grasp this idea because it totally goes against most most political theories about how the world, world works. Uh, like there's something, uh, everything political, every, every, uh, everything that is, uh, every decision made by a politician will have to be funded by taxes somehow or by some other means by uh, like so i see it as the, the, there's an origin like it's a zero a zero point and then all politics are to the left of that and the closer you can get to the zero the better off you are <laughs> uh, and and this is this is from mises straight off like okay. uh the less regulation there is and the, the less bullshit there is the more people can interact with each other in a peaceful manner and uh, cooperate instead of like uh, cohese each other into certain behaviors because I I believe people should be able to do whatever they like by their own free will and that won't happen uh, as long as democracy is around but it, w it could happen if we had the tools to uh, to opt out and that that is what I think Bitcoin is a beautiful. tool for opting out. Beautiful said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, before we wrap up with, I don't know, a couple of questions by a, f a Twitter follower. Um, can we talk about this one shot principle? Or Hodlad, you I mean, since you since you uh, Hodlad, you, you wrote the afterward. Wh how do you how do you interpret or how do you how would you communicate the one shot principle that uh, Knut, um, you know, um, elaborates on in his book on page 80, I think it is. But the absolute mathematical scarcity, discovery, and black swan event. Yeah, I can I can give my thoughts on it. I, I wrote the foreword, by the way. I, I'm not sure. Ah, foreword. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, to me, it, it really feels like yeah, we had one shot at this. And uh, to me, that is because I mean, Bitcoin is is decentralization. That's and that's like also the the only argument you need in my opinion to to shoot down any shitcoin project because if it's not decentralized it's a database and we we don't need more databases and uh, in my opinion only bitcoin is uh, truly decentralized in a really meaningful manner and to achieve that uh, i think bitcoin needed to grow i i call it to grow in obscurity for for years basically to to get its roots spread in the right way, to, to not be co-opted or uh, made into something it uh, it didn't try to be at an early stage. And Bitcoin had those years. It had that opportunity to grow in absolute obscurity, basically, for several years. Uh, and that will not happen again with blockchain technology. 
and uh, I think I think that that's where it's at. But we it's not possible to to at this point create a new a new project that will have uh, organic decentralization. Oh, this uh, I don't remember who said this, but if if you take a shower and then you use a towel to dry yourself off. You get a completely different result than if you use the towel first and shower afterwards. <laughs> That's very really logical. You know, you know, you know what I mean. The 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 uh, the order in which something plays out is very very important, yes. especially for a system like Bitcoin. Yeah. And it and it has its history. It happened yeah. the way it happened. Yeah. And that's why we believe in it. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't sure until August the first, three years ago. Same, same, same. Yeah, that that's that, that was the layer of the Honey Badger armor that needed to be proven, and that that kind of made it irreversible for me that moment. Exactly. Oh, I love this huddle knot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the the this that that was the moment that it truly truly clicked for me that this this thing is unstoppable truly unstoppable yeah and it, uh, need, it needed all those previous uh, uh, incrementations of uh, hardening of the armor before it too it's yes it's been, it's, it's been continuously attacked and it's been continuously attempted uh, uh, attempted destroyed or co-opted but I mean it, it kept growing stronger and just the way these attacks happened we needed these attacks and I think yeah uh, basically, it's so tr true that uh, this is good for Bitcoin. Uh, the meme is basically it. It just it's so true. Yes, and uh, there are so many, so many people that deliberately or not misinterpret the the very purpose of of, of digital scarcity. Yeah, uh, like I saw Eric Voorhees tweet today that uh, now that Bitcoin goes up in price, make sure to use some to help charities or whatever to help people in need and I tweeted back like yes use it don't trade it <laughs> just yeah. hod hodl it mm -hmm. because that is the best use case there is and you will help everyone that owns just a fraction of a Bitcoin because you will drive the price up so don't switch it don't exchange it for anything just hold it that's yes. the best use case and that's the best way you can help others you even have it in your name. <laughs> savings technology. Uh, yeah, yeah, savings technology. And the thing is, uh, it's th this this make it makes it such a different beast than every other type of money that preceded it. Yeah. Be because uh, the, the amount of good you can do to yourself and other Bitcoiners by simply not using it is is a completely new thing. Right. That wasn't even true during the gold standard, <laughs> uh, not in the same sense. So, uh, so I really believe that we only have one shot at this because if if something replaces this, we're screwed because there's no, there are no guarantees then that that there won't be an, another and another and another replacement. Yeah, tr trying to trying to fund hodling Bitcoin is just I mean it's so absolutely stupid. Uh, it's like basically hudding the desirability of owning Bitcoin. And what kind of exercise is that? Like, is it bad for Bitcoin that people want to hold it? Uh, is that is that his? Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense. It's no. And it's just basically a, a testament to like the intrinsic value of Bitcoin. I think uh, the intrinsic value being that people recognize its scarcity and want exactly. to hold it. Yeah, that's yeah. Sacro sacrosanct, the absolute scarcity. And it's mm. a part of maturity process. I mean, it's a monetary evolution. I yeah. mean, what do you expect after 11 or 12 years? It's, it's got to go through this process. There's no other way. Yeah. And no. it makes sense to me. So uh, can I ask you, because um, there's a question from Hodl King, Bitcoin Hodl King. Where do you see Bitcoin uh, in twenty end of 2020, 2020, 2020 or 2021? Uh, and uh, conservative assessment, what percentage of my portfolio do you recommend to put in Bitcoin? And then maybe you can close up, like, what is your vision, like in 10, 20 years? Where do you, where do you see society? Where do you see Bitcoin? Where do you see all of us? Both Who of was you. that question for? Uh, for both of you. <laughs> 
Yeah, I can answer first. Like in, in general, I only make price prediction at a certain level and we passed it. Uh, so we will obviously <laughs> ne never, never see Bitcoin below 10K again. But uh, uh, at like short term, end of 20, end of 21, I, I don't want to give any predictions but I, because I think it's, uh, I don't think it's possible for me to do so. But uh, uh, like longer term, like I'm absolutely confident that we will see million dollar Bitcoin, $10 million Bitcoin. Uh, in purchasing power. <laughs> don't think in fiat. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, bo in both terms. Uh, so, uh, and the, uh, I do think that we are standing at the at the dawn of a of a pretty amazing bull run now. Uh, if that will play out in twenty twenty or twenty twenty one, I'm not sure. But I think uh, I think it will be really face melting. What's going to happen? <laughs> yeah. Uh, about the price predictions, we've we've been predicting this a couple of times now, both you and I. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just want to say that we've been right all along because uh, from a personal perspective you decide the value of your bitcoin no one else does that a number on a screen yeah. is not the value of your bitcoin you decide the value of your bitcoin yeah. people people don't get this and uh, once once you start seeing that you it's impossible to not see it as like the greatest superpower that was ever invented like yeah. uh, th this is a thing that I decide the value of. All I have to do is wait. This is where a trend this goes for. Uh, this is the beauty of the term hodlers of last resort. Uh, that's a very real thing. And it's a diff very big difference between being a self proclaimed hodler and uh, being a hodler of last resort. Because a hodler of last resort uh, will not be faced at all by the fiat value. Like when, we, when this bull run gets started and we pass 100K. It's not like a hodler of last resort will start sweating and like, oh shit, should I sell my Bitcoin? No, that's not going to happen. Uh, because they they may realize like a very small amount to like balance out their uh, their uh, low, high time preference thinking in their lives. But uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, the real hodlers will have any problem hodling through this next bull market. No. I, I believe everyone has a price. Uh, and uh, I'm sure there are some people that have an infinitely high price as well that would never ever sell but the thing is this this is the beauty of the mechanism in layman's terms like uh, everyone has a price and you don't have to sell all of your Bitcoin you can sell a fraction of them and yeah. at the same time the supply is decreasing or it's not well it is decreasing in the long run because some Bitcoins will be lost forever Mm -hmm. So, so it's it's right now the supply is increasing, but at, dec at a decreasing rate, and at some point in time it will be decreasing for every year that passes. And you pair that with uh, uh, like just the demand from the people that are holders of last resort at this moment, just the demand from the dollar cost averaging people at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. And and it's well enough to to, to uh, drive the price up forever. So, yeah, and that and that's uh, not taking into account uh, institutions, um, the nation states, and central banks that yeah. may may or may not join this party at some point. Oh, that, funny you should mention that because I'd like your thoughts on that pod or not. I'd, uh, like I've been talking about this in other podcasts. Can nation states and institutions actually own Bitcoin because of the uh, individual nature of, of uh, the private keys? Could someone actually own Bitcoin? Like when, when I saw that Venezuela, for instance, takes payments in Bitcoin for uh, passports for Venezuelan expats, uh, where does that money end up? Who owns the private key to that money? Is it Maduro himself? Is it some nerd at the institution? Is it a, like a 20 key multisig at the institution? Is it a multisig mm -hmm. of the entire country's I, I, population? I would How think I would think they would just uh, leverage uh, like one of the existing cust the custodial solutions, like basically like the same way the Norwegian oil fund uh, has its assets stored with different uh, different uh, centralized uh, 
structures? Yes, but with Bitcoin, it's Bitcoin is such a different beast. I mean, uh, when when the information, like before Bitcoin, information was just metaphorically uh, valuable or indirectly valuable. Mm -hmm. But with Bitcoin, the information is the valuable asset. Like the the information about the Bitcoin is the underlying asset. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't represent anything. It's the actual information that is valuable. So whoever holds those keys mm -hmm. has the Bitcoin. Yeah. And there's like, and if it goes up 10x, that person will be very much richer and can get the hell out of Boston in in no time. <laughs> if you I know what I mean. So as, it, long, it, yeah. as, as long as we have nation states, I guess they will just, uh, you know, they will always rely on uh, violence to to enforce their uh, their ownership, I guess. Yeah, but this this is the thing. This is the thing. If you if you if you run this thought experiment further, uh, further into the future, it would be impossible. With, like, uh, in a, in a certain article, whom I shall not name, I I, <laughs> uh, I argue about this when when entire populations have uh, unknown amounts of of uh, money in their heads, walking around the earth. Mm -hmm. There's just no room for nation states or institutions of any kind in a world mm -hmm. like that, or they or they will be so uh, they uh, so insignificant to to people's lives because they won't be needed any longer. Uh, when you can store like generations of wealth in, in your head, why the hell why the hell would anyone listen to what any institution has to say? Like, to me, to me, this is a is a is a whole different rabbit hole to fall into. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's interesting. But I, I mean, I, in my head, it still seems like, yeah, at least in the transitional period, that uh, the the existing state structures will be able to to like hold Bitcoin through intermediaries uh, or even make up their own. They're experts at making uh, rules and regulations and bureaucratic mm. shit. So yeah, yeah. I mean, they would probably manage to do so with the key management as well if they were. Put to the test. I I foresee a huge huge apparatus around this, mm -hmm. and uh, once they start, and like you see, at least uh, like you say, short term, and then like in in uh, X amount of years from now, it will see the first headline of a. Uh, an entire nation's Bitcoin funds just disappearing somewhere <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because because someone oh someone God. in the hierarchy doesn't doesn't know what they're doing mm -hmm. uh, or uh, and uh, I, I don't believe I mean these organizations are so bad at organizing themselves already so <laughs> I, I just don't see this ever working out for them yeah, because there is no rollback function in Bitcoin, so it's, it's going to be no. problems for sure. Yeah, but anyway, I see a, a opportunities. Huge, yeah, a sudden <laughs> mass adoption, adoption, and through uh, you know hash mining of you now Iran has allowed it without you know and telling people you can mine but cannot benefit from the subsidies, and you know it's going to be like a huge jurisdictional arbitrage going on, competition. It's good. It's all good for us, for Bitcoin. So I see a bright future ahead of us. What do you think? Yeah, well, uh, I would be a bright future. Uh, bright in comparison to what would be if Bitcoin didn't exist. Uh, not not ne necessarily objectively bright, but like bright in comparison to Bitcoin didn't exist. Yeah, I agree. All right. That's really enjoyed our talk. Thanks so much for, our time, for your time, guys. I really enjoyed this. Uh, can you can you tell my listeners where to f uh, find you? It's like, yeah, you go first. Please. Yeah, what? I'm. Uh, my Bitcoin stuff is mainly on Twitter, uh, so just follow me at at Knut And then, of course, there's my there are my you can find them there, or you can message me and buy them for Bitcoin if you want to uh, and uh, yeah Hodlonaut is also mainly on Twitter yeah uh, and uh, you can find uh, the project uh, the Bitcoin cultural magazine me and 
Bitcoin Katja is making at uh, citadel21.com. Great. And there are two very good articles written by uh, by Knut. Yeah, I've been following yeah. them. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'd like to. I'd like to shill Citadel 21 uh, a, a little as well. I mean, humble about uh, like this this fanzine or magazine uh, is is completely amazing. Just the covers, the artists that made the covers. Uh, I I got the the painting from now, uh, and I bought a frame for it, and just going to hang it up on my one of my walls here one of these days. Uh, and it's a beautiful piece, and uh, like that, that you onboarded so many cool people. It's amazing to be a part of. And I'll uh... thank you, man. Uh, huge, huge shout out to Martin Fisher, Cyberpunk now, who made that cover and who yeah who sent the, that huge poster to everyone he he painted in it. Yeah, yeah. Just talking about it makes the hairs on my arms stand here. <laughs> like, I'm, uh, it's, yeah, it's it's so uh, it's such a cool thing to be uh, a part of. I'm uh, I'm yeah. so grateful for all of this. I'm so bullish on Bitcoiners. That's my final yeah. uh, final statement here. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I think your Bitcoiners are so awesome. Yeah, we totally agree on that. Well, thanks so much. I'm I'm a huge fan of both of you. Thanks so much, Knut, for you know doing all this work. It's uh, I mean you're doing indispensable, precious work, educating, inspiring Thank people, you. empowering. Hodlana, thanks so much for everything you do in the background, and for Citadel 21, and keep up the yeah beautiful and, spirit. <laughs> and for Thank the uh, and for the trust chain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fun times. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. So thanks so much, and have a good Sunday. Thank you, guys. Same to you. Thank you, Kevin. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. So what do you think, guys? I really enjoyed this talk. Always fun uh, talk with uh, Knud and for the first time with Hodlonaut. Make sure you follow them on uh, on Twitter. It's Hodlonaut and uh, Knud Svalholm. I'm going to put it in the show notes. Make sure you read or uh, listen uh, uh, by uh, the Bitcoin on Bitcoin Audible on Guy Swan's uh, p- page uh, or the Crypto Economy that was his original name. Um, it's also as an audio available. So uh, sovereignty through mathematics and Bitcoin independence reimagined. Uh, I have it uh, as a uh, as a hardcover or what do you call it, soft cover but also have most of my books on Kindle, so it's great always to have them around with me. And yeah, it's it's just really empowering, inspiring. Anyway, thanks so much. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, subscribe to my YouTube channel, to my podcast platforms. Thank, uh, and, and if you want to sponsor me, please get in touch with me. My email address is hello at thetotalconnector.com. And you can find me on any social media platform, LinkedIn, Facebook, Telegram, um, and Twitter, and yeah, anywhere. Uh, so thank you so much for your support and and I can't wait for another special uh, session which I'm going to surprise you with in next or uh, or maybe two weeks or something like that. Thank you so much and bye. Have a good